Thank you all so much for joining us. My name is David Ackerley. I am Dean of Rouser College of Natural Resources. Thank you, Mio, for setting this program up. Uh, it, this is a real pleasure. I can see on the participant list, students, alumni, some faculty, uh, a, a real, really wide range. And I'm not surprised as it uh, will be a pleasure to listen to our speaker today. Uh, the Beers Environmental Leadership Program began in the year 2000 under the academic leadership of Professor David Zilberman, who is joining us today. And its first cohort came in 2001. So this year would, is the 20th anniversary and would have been a wonderful year-long celebration that we would have held as part of our in-person program during the summer. But not surprisingly, I think to anyone in this call, we did have to cancel this, uh, this last summer's in-person program because of COVID-19. So we're really glad we can bring you this virtual event. Um, one of the very few um, bright spots around COVID has been all of us discovering the power of of Zoom to bring our programming out to people who would not be able to join us in person and to a much broader audience. So we welcome everyone who's joined us today. And this is one of several ways that we're commemorating these 20 years of excellence and commitment to providing opportunities for lifelong learning. So today, Professor Zilberman continues to provide academic oversight to the Beers ELP program, along with former Dean and Professor Emeritus Keith Gillis and Professor Max Offhammer, who will be presenting in a few minutes, along with an array of uh, instructors and faculty and others who make um, great contributions to the program, all with uh, wonderful leadership and coordination from uh, Mio, who many of you know. Now, in terms of the logistics, uh, when uh, Max will present for 25 to 30 minutes, and we should have plenty of time for Q&A. So please go ahead and submit your questions in the chat function in Zoom. Uh, if you have technical issues, you can also send a private message to the Beers ELP account there. Uh, and I'll just apologize in advance that it, more often than not in these programs, we're unable to get to all of your questions, but we really do appreciate all of the interest. So the last four years have been unusual to say the least, uh, and maybe this year, the most unusual of all. But as we've all witnessed, the Trump administration undertook a rollback of federal environmental regulations that was really unprecedented in any uh, of any recent administration, and also retreated from the international dialogue on climate change, most notably in their withdrawal from the Paris Accord. And in both of these arenas, we have seen the role of sound science diminish dramatically in our policy making. And now after the election of Joe Biden and Kamala Harris last month, one thing we know is will be a return to the Paris Agreement, among many other things. Uh, the role of science in policy making and domestic and international engagement around climate policy are all expected to make a return to the White House. This will not be an easy task, not only against such a dramatic backdrop of the last four years, but also as we work our way out of the pandemic in the year ahead uh, with all of the fallout that may take even longer to fully recover from. Now as the selection of cabinet members and other key leadership positions is becoming public, we're beginning to get a, a look at the administration's policy priorities. And of course, uh, a lot of people on the Berkeley campus and beyond can, are even part of those, some of those transition discussions. Uh, today, we are especially fortunate to have one of our esteemed faculty sh to shed light on what we can expect in this new administration and this new chapter of U.S. history. Professor Max Offhammer is the George Pardee Jr. Professor of International Sustainable Development in the Department of Agricultural and Resource Economics at Rouser College of Natural Resources and Associate Dean in the Division of Social Sciences at UC Berkeley. He joined the faculty at Berkeley in 2003 after receiving a PhD from UC San Diego. His research focuses on environmental and resource economics, energy economics, and applied econometrics. As the George Pardee Jr. Chair, he has been serving as part of the academic leadership of the Beers Environmental Leadership Program. His sessions on impact assessment and how to give effective presentations are always extremely popular among the ELP participants. And again, we're thrilled to have ELP alumni among those joining us today, as well as all of our audience. So welcome, Max. I'll turn it over to you. Well, thank you, David. I really appreciate uh, this wonderful opportunity. And I just wanted to thank uh, broadly the University of California for continuing to support research on climate change, both the physical dimensions of it, but very much so the all important uh, social implications of what is going to happen due to climate change and also as a consequence of, of regulation. 
Also wanted to thank the Rouser College, uh, the home of the Bears ELP, and especially the folks who make this happen. Uh, Mio, who runs this program on a day-to-day -day basis, has just done a phenomenal job keeping us all connected uh, while we're all in our uh, home offices and kitchen tables trying to continue to generate the science that hopefully will serve as a basis for a better tomorrow. Uh, I also wanted to give a shout out to the ELP scholars around the world. This program has been going for 20 ish years now, uh, and we have trained a large number of individuals uh, in what we think is important stuff to know. But frankly, the secret is we learn just as much from the ELP scholars as you do uh, from us. So I hope you're all safe uh, where you are. Uh, the ELP every year is the highlight of, of this scholar's uh, sort of presentation circuit. Uh, what a wonderful couple of hours to spend with such an engaged group of, of scholars, and I can't wait to see the next generation of, of ELP scholars in one of the next few uh, summers. So let me turn to what I was asked uh, to talk about. These are clearly uh, very scary times. Uh, when we scheduled this particular talk, we weren't quite sure who was going to be the next president-elect. Was it going to be a Biden administration or a Trump administration? Uh, plans were sort of being formed on what the priorities for a possible uh, Biden environmental climate plan were, were going to be. Uh, and there is, still is uh, some uncertainty as to what is going to be able to be accomplished. Uh, yes, we have um, I mean, President-elect Biden and, and Vice President Harris uh, who are going to step in January 20th. I apologize if I get that date wrong. I wasn't born here, but I do believe that one's correct. There is still much uncertainty because the way we make regulation in the United States does not just involve the president, but it does involve Congress, which is the House, uh, which is in, in, in Democratic hands, but it's not clear what's going on in the Senate uh, next year as there are two key races in, in Georgia that we will learn the outcome of uh, in the near future. So what I'm going to talk about today uh, might change in January depending on uh, who controls the Senate, but here are just some basic thoughts of and hopes of what I think the Biden-Harris administration could accomplish and the implications for uh, what this means for the not just domestic environment, but for the global environment. So here comes the all important quick. Let's see if the slides advance. I retried it earlier. Here we go. Uh, so often when uh, we see a, a new administration uh, come in that makes the environment a priority, uh, the other side often discovers that uh, you know we need to focus on economic growth, and I will talk about this very much. And there's this implicit assumption that the economy and the environment are at odds, uh, or as we economists call them, they're substitutes. When the evidence actually points uh, in quite the opposite direction. So I apologize for a few graphs, but you signed on for a lunch seminar, so I figure you can handle a few more graphs at noon than you can at 5 p.m. Uh, this is a graph from a recent paper with an all-star cast uh, that's a, a about to come out in the Journal of Economic Literature, where we just show what happens to, this is air quality and, and lead in the United States and what happened to GDP. So what you're seeing here is since 1980, uh, GDP has gone up steadily and uh, air quality has improved pretty drastically. Of course, it hasn't improved uniformly across the United States, but if you take certain averages, uh, it's certainly gotten drastically better, and much of this is due to uh, regulation. The one that stands out here is the gray one at the bottom. We've essentially done away with uh, lead pollution, which was a massive problem uh, in the past. So the point I'm trying to make with this slide here, uh, the environment and, and the economy, we should maybe think of them more as, uh, as French fries and ketchup. They go very well uh, together. So. Do we still have a problem? Can we just sit back and, and, and let time go on and everything is going to be okay? The answer is clearly a, a resounding no. 
I want to remind us all that uh, local air pollution and global air pollution are, are two different things. So when I'm going to talk about local air pollutants today, I'm talking about things like uh, particulate matter and, and, and sulfur uh, pollution, things that come out of you know smokestacks and, and tailpipes, along with greenhouse gas emissions, but that have very much local consequences, which is different from the global pollutants we'll talk about, carbon dioxide being the key one, which once it comes out of the tailpipe of your vehicle, causes damages worldwide. So this picture here is just pointing out what has happened to death rates from air pollution worldwide. Again, it's one way of presenting the data. But if you look at the red dotted uh, graph or line on top here, since 1990, so this is roughly a, a 30 year period, we've seen a drastic drop in death rates from air pollution across the world. Now, if you, un, you know, if you open the hood here and see what's done that, the uh, turquoise line at the bottom, which is outdoor particulate matter, uh, stays roughly flat. But what we're seeing is that indoor air pollution uh, has dropped significantly. So worldwide, we have made great strides in improving indoor air quality through cleaner cooking stoves. So one of ARE's uh, superstar recent graduates wrote a wonderful paper on, on uh, the properties of a certain technology and how you could roll it out uh, to improve air quality in the home. But we're still struggling with outdoor particulate uh, matter and other pollutants. For those Back. of you who yeah. I'm sorry, I have to interrupt. The chat is just lit up with people saying they lost audio. Oh, and now someone just said it's back. Can a couple more people confirm that the audio is back in the chat? Please? Can you hear me? Can you okay. hear me, David? Yep. We're good. You might want to repeat sort of the second half of your comments on this slide. OK. I apologize for this. This is home Wi-Fi. I, I paid for the best Wi-Fi I could get, but it's still not fantastic. So let me start uh, the red line up here uh, shows that death rates from air pollution worldwide have dropped significantly over the past 30 years. Uh, and most of those gains come from improvements in indoor air pollution. Basically, how do we cook and heat homes largely in the developing world? Uh, the technology has improved and there have been drastic efforts uh, worldwide to decrease the amount of air pollution indoors. Outdoor air pollution still remains a struggle. Uh, before COVID, you know, academics are frequent travelers, always in the back of the airplane. So if you go to places like uh, rural China or India, or in bad days, LA, uh, outdoor air quality is still not what it, what it should be. So that may, continues to uh, be a, a massive challenge worldwide. I just want to acknowledge uh, someone on the UC campus uh, whom we lost this year. Kirk Smith, when I first came to this campus, is of course one of the uh, most recognized uh, environmental scientists in the world, was also an incredible champion of uh, not just junior scholars, but the causes he, he believed in and has affected uh, so much change that I would go as far as saying that, you know, a part of what we're seeing in this in this previous graph, this drop in, in indoor air pollution is due to the lifetime of his work. So we, we miss Kirk uh, dearly on a day-to-day -day basis, but if you're thinking about an impactful academic, uh, Kirk always comes, uh, comes to mind here. So let's switch. So that was uh, local pollutants. Let's switch to, to global pollutants. So this is data up till 2018, uh, more recent data on, uh, on CO2 emissions. Uh, they, they always lag a little bit. But what, of course, we're seeing here since the beginning of the Industrial Revolution, whether you put it in 1850, 1870, or the later uh, part of the century, doesn't matter. Uh, what we're seeing is just massive growth in CO2 emissions. This is from fossil fuels uh, production and cement production only here by, by country, including transport. But this has uh, increased the amount of CO2 in the atmosphere uh, so significantly, and those levels continue to grow and continue to cause what we're seeing as experienced warming and, of course, anticipated. Uh, warming. Now, is this something you can turn off? Uh, so when we think back to the Montreal Pro Protocol, uh, which regulated 
uh, chlorofluorocarbons, which are substances that were, if you, like me, grew up in the 1980s uh, and like Bruce Springsteen, you may have had big hair with lots of hairspray in your hair. Uh, there were propellants in cans, they were used in foams and so on. There was international regulation that basically phased these out uh, largely. Still working on some aspects of that, incredibly successful. With CO2, this is much harder uh, because CO2 is not just in, you know, a thing where you have to use less hairspray and come up with al alternatives in, in foams and fire extinguishing equipment. It permeates every aspect of our lives, from transportation to heating. Uh, you know, I was thinking about agriculture. It is just everywhere. So turning off CO2 emissions is, of course, a tricky challenge, which explains why we've made such slow progress on international regulations of these emissions. Now, just to remind ourselves, right, economists are known for their ability to say uh, what we say sometimes uh, mildly annoying or, or obnoxious things, but it is important to remember what these CO2 emissions have done. They have fueled unprecedented expansion of, of wealth and pulled a number of people out of poverty that has been unprecedented in, in human history. So if you're thinking about China alone, more than 300 million uh, people were pulled out of poverty in the, in the period of 10 years, and much of that was fueled by uh, coal, largely. So what this graph shows us here, for those of you who are paying attention to units, yes, I am one of these annoying instructors that labels uh, his or her axes properly. This is a log linear graph. So on the left-hand axis, uh, each line has a, a doubling of, of CO2. On the x-axis, you have the level of GDP per capita. But what I'm trying to point out here is Wealthier uh, economies tend to have higher uh, CO2 emissions per capita, which is you know, not that surprising. Uh, the wealthier you are, uh, the more likely you have you know, good heating in your home, the more likely you are to drive and consume sort of energy intensive goods and services. So is income a causal driver of CO2 emissions? It, you know, we could quibble about the word causal here, but the things you buy with your income certainly cause more uh, CO2 emissions for, for most of us. So let's talk about the challenge. Uh, we all hear these words, uh, net zero. What net zero essentially means, and we could have a long discussion as to whether my definition is right, is that uh, we on net emit zero greenhouse gas emissions. That doesn't mean we emit no CO2, but it just means that there are technologies possibly available and functioning that take whatever CO2 we add to the atmosphere uh, back out of it. And we're gonna talk about what we could do on that uh, aspect, but the, the simplest technology here is, is a tree. Now, the question uh, is why do we have this big uh, to do about net zero emissions? The simple answer here is if we want to limit global warming to 1.5 degrees Celsius, which is a target I'm very worried we're going to sail right past, uh, we are going to have to get to net zero pretty quickly by 2050. So this is my kid's 40th uh, birthday, essentially. If we're willing uh, to go to two degree warming, which is still significant warming, if you've read the IPCC reports, that net zero range moves a little bit later uh, to the later part of the century, uh, and that is still a significant challenge. So think about that graph I just showed you, where emissions are growing and growing and growing, and we're essentially trying to stop, not just stop growth and level off, but we're trying to get it to net zero over the next 30 years. So looking in the rearview mirror, uh, try and think back where you were in 1990, and think about how, you know, we, we basically went from emissions in 1990 to no emissions. That's how much time uh, these, these targets here essentially have embedded in them. I'm also not looking at the chat. Uh, I will answer your questions gladly afterwards. And Dean Ackerley is, is collecting the, the juicy questions, I'm sure, and he's going to get me to stumble on those later. Uh, so let's talk briefly about uh, where we are. Uh, for those of us who've worked on trying to craft uh, the science that can be used to come up 
with cost-effective ways of fixing market failures. Matt, what are you talking about? Uh, what I'm trying to talk about is that economists often uh, yell in these rooms saying we should figure out what our goal is, right? So if our goal is to reduce CO2 emissions, uh, maybe in net zero targets, we should figure out the cheapest way uh, to do that and the most equitable way of doing that. And I'll talk about this in a second. So for those of us who, who believe and, and, and have shown that there are a significant market failures uh, at work here where we are emitting more greenhouse gases and more local pollutants into the air, the water and the soil, uh, than is socially optimal, uh, the direction of recent environmental policy went certainly in the wrong direction. So the New York Times has this tracker uh, that is pretty depressing. I look at it every morning that looks at the uh, track record of the Trump administration uh, over the past three and a half or three and three quarter years. Uh, they've completed, uh, this is a conservative estimate, I should think actually 84 uh, reversals of environmental rules. They're still working on 20, leading to 104 total rollbacks. Have they singled out climate as the number one thing to roll back? The answer is no. Uh, this was an all out uh, attack and assault on, on environmental protection. So this focused on, on local air pollution, uh, drilling, infrastructure, uh, endangered species or animals, pollution of water, uh, toxic substances emitted into all kinds of media and a few other ones which we're going to talk about. So when we think about going forward, uh, good policy can be two things, right? Good policy can be on the one hand, coming up with great new plans and great new solutions that haven't been tried before. But as some of my friends who've worked in previous, uh, you know, uh, administrations in the White House have said, sometimes good policy is just undoing uh, bad policy or preventing further uh, bad policy. So my, my thoughts here are going to be focused on both dimensions here. What, what should be undone uh, and what additional things could we do that, that haven't been tried? And again, this is just a small set of the things that, that could be done uh, since this is a half hour talk. So to me, we're in the middle of, of watching uh, the, the Biden-Harris transition team trying to staff agencies. Uh, if you're on Twitter, you see all kinds of academics and policy folks angling, trying to figure out how to get appointments in the, in the new uh, administration. There are literally thousands of jobs to be filled. But if you're concerned about the environment, there are more than this, but sort of six key agencies and departments that are going to um, play a significant role in whatever the environmental uh, policy future of the United States is going to be. This is, of course, the US Department of the Interior, the Environmental Protection Agency. So rumor uh, for the EPA is that maybe Mary Nichols uh, will be the next uh, person running the EPA. But Department of Transportation uh, is important because in California, 40% of our CO2 emissions come from the transport sector. Nationally, it's less than that. Uh, but that's clearly a, a key part of the government. Uh, Treasury has a role in, in climate change as well. DOE is, of course, a key department that, you know, one of the portfolio is all things nuclear, but the other part of the portfolio is, uh, you know, energy efficiency. Uh, and we're going to talk about this in a second, the measuring and, and reporting of what's happening in the energy economy. And finally, Department of State. Uh, which is clearly going to play a key role in the future of where the United States stands in uh, the global uh, theater that is going to play out uh, what the future of the climate is. So to me, uh, after we figured out an all-star team uh, in, in these agencies, and I'm not just talking at the very highest levels, I'm not just talking about secretaries of, of, of these places, but I'm talking at sort of sub uh, cabinet level positions that are going to do a lot of the implementation here. But I do think the first step here is to rejoin Paris. I am not a lawyer. I don't know how you do that. Uh, but my lawyer friends tell me that there is a way. Uh, rejoin the Paris Agreement. And uh, I was going to say get the band back together. But I think significant things have happened over the past four years. Uh, and the big developments here 
is China emerging as a leader in, in trying to get us towards a sustainable climate path. So Governor Jerry Brown had a very nice op-ed in the Los Angeles Times today, uh, or could, could have been a couple of days ago. Uh, I read it, time sort of merges into one big pudding at this point, uh, but arguing that one of the first steps should be for uh, the Biden administration to engage with China uh, in what the future joint efforts on climate are going to be. And I would, of course, pull in the European Union, who have been uh, very aggressive on their net zero and climate targets. So this is not new. This has been stated uh, by the, the uh, Biden transition team already. But I just wanted to point this out, that this is the top three emitters in the world who now all have stated very aggressive climate goals and can take a joint leadership role uh, trying to you know, follow up on the Paris Agreement and figure out what the path is going to be to get us towards uh, net, net zero. Okay, I'm not going to go through all of these. I was reading through a list of, of things that happened during the last three and a half years. So this is my uh, part of the, the sort of bucket list of uh, rules and regulations that were either undone or rewritten in ways that made them worse for the uh, environment and uh, definitely did not improve economic efficiency along the way. But these are things that, to me, uh, should be undone rather rapidly. Uh, the first one on that list is the fuel economy standards the Trump administration has finalized in the, in the federal uh, register. So these are uh, rules that roll back the Obama era fuel economy standards and basically allows uh, less, significantly less fuel efficient cars on the road compared to previous uh, proposed rules. Uh, the California waiver, which for those of us, maybe this is a California academic worried about California's right to uh, come up with more aggressive uh, air pollution regulation than the rest of the country because we're snooty Californians. California has a long history of coming up with new novel regulations, implementing them and learning a lot along the way, which then has spilled over to environmental regulations, not just in the rest of the country, but across the Atlantic and the Pacific. I would argue what we've learned here in terms of energy efficiency standards, uh, how to do a cap and trade, for example, has spilled over uh, to, uh, to Europe and China for sure. Uh, the mercury rule is another one I'm not going to talk much about, but uh, my colleague uh, Meredith Crowley and a few others have, have some writing on that. One thing that I think is key that's sort of flown under the radar for quite a while is the damage that's been done to data collection efforts by basically not requiring certain emitters to report how much they're emitting uh, or uh, stopping the monitoring of certain pollutants or counting uh, how much is being generated in terms of certain um, certain pollutants from different activities. So I'm thinking of, in my personal view, the, the Energy uh, Information Administration, which is maybe the nerdiest of all energy uh, agencies, but one of my favorites because they have for decades provided us, both academics, firms, and policymakers, with accurate and really well executed uh, data that forms uh, the basis for good policymaking. So letting EIA and other data collection agencies do what they do um, is I think important. It's not expensive to do and will allow us to make better decisions. The social cost of carbon uh, is you can look if you want to learn more about the social cost of, of carbon. There's a YouTube video where I talk about it or search social cost of carbon, but it's essentially the damage one ton of CO2 does over its lifetime once it's emitted. Under the Obama administration, that was calculated to be roughly $42 for a 2020 uh, emitted ton. Uh, there are some nerdy parameters in calculating that particular number. The two big ones being whether you only care about people in the United States or you care about humans and species elsewhere. And the second one is how much do you value future administrations? The Trump administration basically decided we're only going to care 
about uh, individuals on U.S. soil. Uh, their exact calculations don't account for U.S. citizens abroad, of which there are many in the armed forces and not in the armed forces. And they also basically put zero weight on, on anybody born after 20, 40, 2050, something uh, like that. So going back uh, and taking the social cost of carbon, which is only used in benefit cost analysis, where we evaluate policies to figure out and take into account how much damage uh, CO2 actually does on society. And if we save the CO2, what is that in terms of benefits? In the Trump administration, it's somewhere between a dollar and seven dollars. Under Obama, it was President Obama, it was $42 uh, and possibly slightly more, depending on how you, you count it. We should just go back to what we had under the Obama administration, since it is economically the right uh, number, and we should push efforts to update that social cost of carbon uh, to incorporate the latest science. Much of this is being done here uh, at Berkeley in collaboration uh, with the University of Chicago, which is not necessarily known for its uh, regulation-friendly attitude, and uh, Rutgers, and also the uh, the Berlin group. There are more rules here. I'm looking at the list of people who are who are on this talk right here. Uh, I know many of you care about coal leases on public lands. We are leasing lands at uh, at at, uh, at very low cost. Uh, there are lots of concerns about rules surrounding the drilling for natural gas fracking and and, and methane leaks. This is a massive issue. If you're interested in that, I would point you to the Energy Institute. Uh, at Haas has a blog, which I crack jokes on and my colleagues provide substance. Uh, a great blog yesterday about uh, what's happening there. Uh, there are things like the National Environmental Policy Act. Uh, there's something done to timelines in there that was really worrisome that needs to be undone. The Endangered Species Act, Energy Efficiency Standards, drilling, dot, dot, dot. I intentionally put four dots because three dots weren't enough. Uh, but I'm going to close this particular list and then turn over to the, the bigger issues here uh, by just saying one policy that's still being pushed through uh, at breakneck speed is one that I actually do lose sleep overnight, which is a rule that would prevent uh, agencies from considering science that doesn't have all of its data publicly available. What that means is if you have a study and you have confidential data from, a, from uh, you know, in a medical trial, for example, where you can't make the information publicly available, that study would have to be discarded. This is such a large part of science, especially if we're talking about the environment where damages to human health and mortality are key, that we work with a lot of confidential data and forcing agencies to throw out that huge portion of science would do permanent damage to our ability to write, uh, write good rules. So I'm very much worried about that particular effort. Okay, so I would just off the bat say here, I read the Biden plan for clean energy revolution and environmental justice, and, and I liked a lot of what I, what I saw there. If you haven't read it, go to their website. It's not a very long read. Uh, but it hits all the sort of topics that you know I would largely agree with, and I look forward to seeing them implemented. But I wanted to elevate a couple of the things that we've seen in here to help us, you know, think a little bit about this. So what we teach in the undergraduate in the graduate classroom is the same thing: markets fail, right? Any card-carrying economist on the face of the planet will tell you that we don't believe that all markets are perfectly competitive and we should leave people and firms alone and they will do the right thing. In fact, when I teach this, I teach this as sort of an almost unicorn benchmark against which we measure uh, real markets. Most markets are imperfect and no more so than in the environmental arena. So, this is straight, I should have put quotation marks here. This is straight from the, the Biden-Harris plan, work with Congress to enact in 2021 20, uh, uh, legislation that by the end of his first term puts us on an irreversible path to achieve economy-wide net zero emissions no later than 2050. 
So I think if I don't misread this, this is almost a, a commitment to a 1.5 degree uh, net zero path. But I think the wrong thing is bolded. So this is what they bolded in their plan. I, will, I would switch this. I would bold this sentence. The legislation must require polluters to bear the full cost of the carbon pollution they're emitting. This is a commitment to a price on carbon, right, uh, to me. So the notion here is for over a century, most of us, most firms, most individuals have used the atmosphere as a free dumping ground for their carbon pollution and other greenhouse gases and aren't paying for the full opportunity cost of their action. So here, uh, this singles out a notion that all of us should bear the full cost of the carbon pollution we are emitting. Now I read this and I sat in front of it and I took a second and I pulled out my red pen because all academics, I actually have a little bucket of red pens right in front of me. Uh, I just fixed that for you. Uh, so I would take out the word carbon here. I know this is a climate statement. But why uh, should we not charge emitters of local air pollutants for the damage uh, they do? So I'm hoping that when we're talking about, you know, making people responsible for their actions, we don't just limit this to global pollutants, but we worry about local pollutants as well. Lever two here is a uh, recovery uh, op opportunity. So let me talk about this for a second. Max, you put an equation in your slides. Well, for those of you who took macro, right, uh, when we're in a recession and interest rates are near zero, the role for monetary policy to get the economy going is somewhat limited, or at least that's what I learned in graduate school from some very talented macro economists. And I'm going to, you know, repeat that statement. If you're looking at what I'm showing you here, this is uh, CO2, not CO2, this is GDP, gross domestic product, which is the value of all goods and services produced in the United States. Uh, since 1950, right, post-World War II, and just to give you a little notion of how big this dip is that we've seen due to the pandemic, this is massive, right, uh, compared to, to uh, what we saw in 2009. Now, I'm not going to speculate about, you know, shapes of recovery and what is going to happen once a vaccine is widely rolled out. But in terms of tools, right, the one tool that the federal government has is government spending, right? So increase that G right here. And the way you want to increase government spending is in ways to generate jobs. Now, in the past, what we've often done is we've tried to come up with infrastructure projects where anybody with a shovel and a truck all of a sudden would be put to work uh, across the United States, fixing highways or building other large uh, projects. Many of you in your neighborhoods saw this, you know, highways being fixed up after the 2009 uh, crisis. But I think this particular uh, recovery comes at a time where we're trying to do two things, right? We're trying to build a new energy economy, which requires a lot of thinking on the market side. So, you know, Severin Bornstein, Catherine Wolfram, Meredith Crowley, Jim Sully, all those folks are going to be really busy trying to figure out how you, you figure out the market side. But there is a tremendous number of fixed infrastructure projects that are going to be required. So in order to make wind and solar and all kinds of other renewables work, uh, we're going to have to think about updating the grid and building transmission infrastructure where there is none currently. Building infrastructure is not cheap, uh, and this might be the time to do it. So it's not just the solar panels and the windmills, but it's the wires that carry the, what I like to call green electrons, which then some nuclear physicist always yells at me for calling it electrons because they're not green. I know that. Uh, but uh, electrons generated by renewable sources. The other thing I would like to raise here is the notion of carbon sequestration and storage. The last ton of CO2, if we just take it away without sequestration and storage, is going to be infinitely expensive to abate. There are some really high benefit, high cost uh, uses of, of fossil fuels. So what you want to think about is in the long run, likely still have some CO2 emissions that are then offset by sequestration and, and storage. 
So trees are everybody's favorite. Uh, Jeff Vincent at Duke has written some interesting stuff about this lately. Uh, there's lots of papers around arguing, can you do this with just trees? It seems like you cannot. But I do think uh, ignoring the potential for uh, sequestering carbon at the source is uh, just saying this is a bad idea because fossil fuels have a bad rap is it's too early to call that. So I think investing in researching that technology and whether it works and how expensive it is and, and in which locations does it actually work uh, is a key aspect of, of what we should be investing in. Last but not least, transportation is the big one. So if you've driven an electric car, they're super fun. They're getting cheaper. Most manufacturers are rolling them out. Uh, that's not the one I'm so worried about is you driving your, your electric car around. What I'm worried about is heavy duty vehicles. Heavy duty vehicles emit a large share of the local pollutants in urban environments and cause lots of damage to children, adults across the place. So trying to figure out how to both get local pollutants and global pollutants out of the transport sector with a focus on heavy transportation to me should be at the very front of the list. And this is where it's not clear whether electric is the way to go or whether hydrogen is some sort of part solution there, but that has to be put at the forefront. California is doing this already, but I think this is a national level uh, effort here. I know I'm going over time a little bit, but I do want to talk about equity. Economists, again, I'm fully aware of, of my role, right? I am the sort of least fun uh, person at, at any party. Uh, we've been known that we talk about efficiency all the time. Take your resources and make the biggest pie, birthday pie you can uh, make out of the resources you have and you're done. We have a bad reputation for trying to figure out which kid at the birthday table should get what size of the pie. So why are you talking about birthday parties, Max? Pollution is exactly like that. Fixing average local pollutant levels at the national level ignores the fact that poor and disadvantaged communities across the state of California and across this beautiful planet of ours experience disproportionately higher levels of pollution and worse water quality than their wealthy counterparts. So there's a really nice paper by Josh Apte and, and, and others who's now at Berkeley, very exciting, uh, back at Berkeley, showing in West Oakland, uh, if you look at four kilometers, about two and a half miles, some areas have five to eight times higher pollution areas than others. So trying to think about who benefits from these regulations and what kinds of regulations do we pass and what the equity impacts are here is important. All right, Mia, this is my last slide. We worry about distributional impacts. And when we think about distribution, we always think about spatial distribution. Who lives where, right? What kind of communities live in the Central Valley with historically bad air quality? Yes, there are younger communities with a larger share of Latinx uh, population. But I also want to make the point here that there's also equity issues across time. The people who are going to bear the burden uh, of climate change are my 12 year old now, right, who's going to be hopefully, you know, if I can't do the math right now, oh yeah, I can, 88 years old by, by the time he's. Uh, is uh, the 22nd century rolls around. So the notion here is we've made this a discussion of politicians and old guys like me and not given the younger generation much of a formal voice in this particular uh, dialogue. So many of you have you know, heard of Greta Thunberg, but there's lots of other uh, leaders in the United States and abroad that are raising these issues. and giving them a more formal voice and a more formal platform and engaging with them in a meaningful, constructive way, I think is absolutely uh, key for this next administration. So I'm gonna stop talking there. If you have any questions, uh, this is my email address. I love the people who tell me that I love what you said, but I, I like a good argument just as well. So please feel free to reach out and I'm happy to, to answer any questions that, that Dean Hackerley has collected. Max, thank you so much on behalf of the entire audience. The one 
we can reach broad audiences with Zoom, but we don't do very well clapping, which of course everyone would be doing if we were in person. Um, so uh, a round of applause there. Um, I'm gonna pick up questions in the order they came in, which means I'm gonna ask you to jump back in your talk first. And the very first question was you had six agencies very nicely balanced on your slide, but USDA wasn't up there. Any, um, any comments about USDA's role in environmental and climate policy, especially here we are as a, as a, an, a historic ag college ourselves. So they have their, 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 their separate slide uh, because I actually think they're one of the most important ones given how much of how many greenhouse gases actually come from the, the agricultural sector, but also by how impacted the agricultural sector was. I'm gonna have to look at my slides. I think I hit in PowerPoint, you can move your slides to the right and then they're hidden. It might be a hidden slide and I forgot to talk about them. So I apologize for this profusely. <laughs> they were supposed to have their own podium in this presentation and I, I screwed that one up. So you're absolutely right. Agriculture is, is key here. Uh, USDA's role, not just in terms of regulation, but also really uh, worrying about research. Uh, the USDA's uh, ERS uh, is one of the greatest collections of ag economists on the face of the, the planet, and uh, they have data that are absolutely amazing. So I'm absolutely with you. Ag has to be a huge part of this, and, and I apologize for not putting it on there. Yep, no, that makes perfect sense. Um, now you led off with, or you, you shared that list of 100 laws and regulations, and that you're not alone in, the, in a lot of people looking at turning those around. Do you have any ins insights on which the Biden administration is likely to reverse first, which are the easiest, which are going to be the hardest? So this is, this is why I chickened out, right? Uh, so, so this is why I said I'm not a lawyer. I don't know what it takes to rejoin, uh, rejoin Paris, for example. I do believe, for example, taking the social cost of carbon uh, back to what it was, I think that's a that's a one document uh, issue here. So this is something that doesn't require further research. We know what the number is, uh, or if we want to update it, we have the models to do it quickly. So that's an easy one. So I think this would be a great uh, second talk by uh, Dan Farber or somebody like that who can tell you from a legal point of view, which ones of these can you uh, reverse. But to me, Going out, and, and this is what the, the John Kerry appointment says to me and everybody else, is the first climate appointment made here was somebody with a clearly international uh, focus signaling that that's gonna be the first step out of the gate. If you read the Biden plan too, that's first, like right up there on the list. Day one, we're gonna join Paris and start working with our partners on efforts to, to solving this problem. So I think that's the first one out of the gate, but I think it'll take, you know, it'll keep the Biden administration busy for the first 100 days to undo a lot of the stuff that's, that's been done here. That's, you know, not subjectively bad policy, but a lot of this stuff, not all of it, but a lot of this stuff is just bad economics and bad science. Uh, yeah, 100, 100 rules in 100 days. A, a rule a day would be quite an accomplishment. Um, like an admin yeah. <laughs> I did hear, of, I heard a fascinating comment on NPR that the Obama administration intentionally made the Paris Agreement hard to leave and easy to rejoin because they were worried about all those other countries who might pull out. And little did we know that it became us who were the ones. Who the ones. So, so the getting back in is apparently you know, much easier and faster than the pulling out was, and that was by design. Um, you focused a lot on the polluter pay comment, your red text there. And there's a question about the, the, the slippery slope and it's kind of a supply chain question. In the supply chain, let's take fossil fuels from extraction from the ground all the way through to a customer burning it in their car, who should pay? So who, who's the polluter? And, the, and actually the questioner also asked about that in, the, in relation to food waste as another example. So I know there's two people on the on the list here that are uh, ones from Stanford that uh, could answer this question better than I can. But the notion here is people always worry is is Target going to have to figure out how much of a carbon charge they're going to have to charge on a number two pencil? The answer is no, right? Uh, so the the answer here is you charge the carbon tax as far upstream as, as you can, and it filters through uh, the supply chain in theory. The question then of course becomes, what about all that stuff that's being produced you know, abroad uh, in China, for example, or a, a place that's not going to have significant sort of climate efforts? 
How do you do that? Do you do a border adjustment, sort of charge that tax at the border on import? So there's a level level, level playing field. There's a, a really active uh, economics literature here, but I think my answer would be domestically, you charge it pretty far upstream and let it trickle through. And then with border tax adjustments, the question becomes, are they legal under WTO? In what form? How do you levy them? And how do you actually calculate the, the carbon content of the goods that are coming uh, coming to us uh, from from abroad? So that becomes a, a trickier issue. So what about what about for food waste? Is there an analogy there? Because of course, there's no carbon emitted at the upstream end in agriculture. Well, there can be, and that's another discussion. But if we think of consumers as being the place where the carbon is being lost, is there an effective economic strategy there? So what you're thinking about is if I don't eat the apple I bought and I throw it out and it rots and it generates a whole bunch of methane or something like that. Yeah, the, the, the carbon loss from food waste, that's, that's right, that's one. Yeah, so I, I think we also have to, to, to worry about the big ones first, right? So to me, the big ones are, let's think about where our CO2 emissions are coming from, right? Uh, let's think about the coal and the gas and the oil, uh, those are relatively easy to do. If we get to sort of food waste distributed across households, I d frankly don't know, it's not an area of my, my research. I don't know how big of a problem that is and, and where on the, on the ladder of you know, importance that, that falls. There are these sort of life cycle uh, type models where you can figure out over the life cycle of whatever it is you're, you're looking at, you know, what's the, what's the, the the damage here in terms of emissions uh, and you know figure it out that way but you're right I mean that gets that gets tricky but we the other thing is we don't need to get it a hundred percent right right so if we got it mostly right we'd be pretty happy uh, in in the beginning the problem is we have it mostly wrong right now in the sense that if you look at implicit subsidies for a lot of these stuff we're not necessarily charging people for the damage they do, but we're implicitly subsidizing fossil fuels worldwide in a staggering uh, amount. Lucas Davis has done work on this. Yeah. Uh, jumping around, one, okay, one of our listeners serves on AC Transit District. Thank you very much for a public transit and notes that we've been running hydrogen fuel cell buses for a couple of decades here. So the question there, and then a quick follow-up is the role of, your view of the role of hydrogen in medium and heavy duty vehicles. And then a related question, is top actions for U.S. cities in the next couple of years um, as we move forward? Great, great question, right? So I see my AC Transit hydrogen bus take a left on Center Street sometimes, and I always admire it, and I'm very proud to be in, in, in Berkeley for that reason. So thank you, AC Transit, for, uh, for, for doing that. I think we need to fire on all cylinders, no pun intended here, trying to figure out what happens to heavy duty, long range and medium range trucking here. Uh, so this includes the sort of trucks that go from Boston to Chicago, but this also includes things as such as drayage trucks and, and, and things like that, where there's trucks just going around harbors, moving uh, containers around that are pumping a lot of diesel pollution into the lungs of the folks uh, living around there. So there is a, a, a nation effort here at the Institute of Transportation Studies and other places looking at that. I have a project with some colleagues up at the Lawrence Berkeley National Labs looking at, at electrification of, of long run trucking. But this is a not only environmental issue, but this is also a labor issue, right? So if you look at the number of people the trucking industry employs, what happens to trucking is not just the environment, but it also has consequences for how many people we employ in that, in that particular sector. So your first question is, what should we do? We should learn from what you've done with your, your buses and you know, talk about that, but we should push as the state and as the federal government into a concerted effort trying to figure out what a, a low carbon or zero carbon long and medium range transport fleet looks like for the United States and then work towards that. 
What was the second part of the question? Oh, it, well, it was an expanded question about the uh, steps for US cities, the most important steps cities can take um, as action items. So what we've seen over and over again, you know, people want to see more public transportation and more, you know, all kind of have wish lists there and insulation of buildings. We build new buildings, yes, they should be well insulated, right? Things where I don't really control the energy consumption and I might not make the optimal decision if I did it myself. There are standards uh, in place in California and nationally can help us with that. So the traditional sort of energy efficiency stuff is important. But to me, and this is gonna be unpopular, thinking about zoning, right? Having people commute for two hours from where they live to where they work, uh, is is not a sustainable climate strategy so trying to think about how we design city where we permit building uh and what type of building uh, we permit you know i live in a nice sort of single family home with a yard that's not the home of the the future most likely right cities might have to build up instead of building out I'm not an urban planner, but CED, the College of Environmental Design here, has some fabulous people working on exactly that problem. But to me, urban planning, taking into account the, of course, related wildfire implications of where we live and where we build is, is of key importance. Yeah, and our new dean of CED is really fascinated by these problems. I'm going to let us run one minute over, Max, because I do want to ask a final question on the equity issues and, and especially for our very international audience here including ELP alums um, how as an economist do you approach the equity and climate justice issues on the international arena and especially the well-known patterns that the countries that have contributed the least to global CO2 are often the ones who will bear the greatest impact so how do we take justice policies to a global scale so I this is the the age-old argument and I'm very sympathetic to it, right? So if we're thinking about CO2, CO2 is a stock pollutant, right? It just accumulates over time. And we in the United States, I was raised in Europe, have benefit, benefited from huge amounts of CO2 pumped in the atmosphere at an earlier stage of economic development. And now we sit in these, you know, very nice uh, environments where other countries are still, you know, a little bit further down on the, on the income uh, scale here. So should developed countries do more? Yes, right? Should uh, we, if I'm thinking about the island nations, for example, help island nations figure out what to do in a, in a world of, you know, a meter sea level rise or more? Uh, absolutely. So I think there's, there's a, a regulatory and a financial responsibility of the developed world to, to help uh, pay for the consequences of what it is that uh, that we've done. How much, how you calculate that, what's the efficient way of doing that, I don't know. There's a big literature and more in law than in, in, in economics talking about this. But as a private citizen, to me, that's the, that's the fair thing um, to do. Well, that's a nice place to end. Not, not that we have all the solutions, but these problems are right in our view and the, and the challenges that are ahead for the future. But Max, a huge thank you again for spending this lunch hour with us. Thank you to all. We, had, we were up to around 190 um, participants, so it was wonderful to see so many people and from all over the world. It was great to have you back at Berkeley briefly, and uh, we wish you all well for the end of this year and uh, keep your eye out for more announcements of future events in the celebration of the ELP's 20th anniversary. Thank you all so much. Wonderful, thank you.